On this one, who wants to describe the middle balls, the middle circles? What, what's the difference between them? Location and size. Okay, location and size. And any other comments? They're the same size. We hear they're the same size. The same size. Higher content, so, same size. So we hear location and size are different. Some people are saying it's the same size. Let's take a look. Take away the bias of the different size rings. They're the same size, that one and that one. They're exact same size. So again, it's a bias. We, we, it's perception. And again, from a document examiner's perspective, what we do is a lot of perception. We do pattern matching. We do looking in, in things of that nature. So what, one of the things we have to look for from a bias perspective is are there surrounding issues and this goes to any forensic science, is there surrounding issues that can adversely affect our perception, our biases? We get, we, we th get things get in the way, things cause perceptive differences. That's where we have to make sure that when we're looking at and understanding, we understand our biases and how, what, what do we mean? So what do we mean by bias? Well, Black's Law Dictionary defines bias as a predisposition to decide a cause or an issue in a certain way. So we go into the case, we already have an idea of how we want to solve it, how, how, we, want, how we think the answer should be. That's our bias. We'll, we'll look at the causes of bias and some of the things we, have, we can look at is, <coughs> we, we say that analysis seeks to produce reliable evidence. Reliable evidence. And as experts, we need to recognize when our biases can interfere with that reliability because we have a perception of what it should be or what we think it is. We all have biases. Is there anyone in this room who does not have a bias of some sort? When, when an expert witness has a bias, mm -hmm. he seems defeating his purpose. He's got to go in with an open mind and call it like it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I'm not that intelligent, but I can't agree with with that theory because you you have uh, you have you have to forget your bias mm -hmm. if you want to be a good expert witness. <coughs> you have to forget your bias, but the idea is you have your biases, and we, and as experts, what part of our job isn't it? As you said, to forget the biases, to go in and partly recognize these biases, so that we can put them aside. We'll, we'll, look, we'll look at some research on that very topic because that's, that's what's really important is that we need to be able to put those biases aside. We need to recognize the biases and be able to do something about it so that it doesn't affect our opinions. So what's cognitive bias? <coughs> this is a, from a researcher from, uh, named Loren. Cognitive bias is faulty patterns of thought resulting in misapplication of judgment heuristics. Any thoughts on that? What is heuristics? A heuristic is a rule of thumb. It's, it's really a rule of thumb. It's a, a way of per perceiving things. It's, it's, it's kind of the way you've always done it. Okay, okay that's, that's what a heuristic is. This is just, show, just an example of some of the topics we'll, t we'll cover, and I'm not going to spend time there. But Niels Bohr said, prediction is very difficult, especially when it's about the future. <laughs> Everyone know who Niels Bohr was? Guy. Yeah. So we t say people apply three important biases in strategic decision making. And that's what we're doing as experts. We're making decisions, not just tactically, but we're making st strategic decisions. Insensitive to probabilities of outcomes. And what that goes to, and especially those of us, for example, in document examination, is needing to understand the base rates. What is the base rate of occurrence of certain types of writing? How, how many people in the population use certain types of writing? Do they use a Zainer Basler or a Palmer, uh, Palmer or, so, or whatever type of writing style that they've been using? We, we, need to, we don't look at it from, we need to understand statistically what our base rates are. We'll talk more and more about this. Focus on performance targets, and which causes us not to think of different alternatives. We go in and we focus. Here's the target we need to, we need to solve. Here's our, the, what we're trying to come, the, the solution we're trying to get. And it, we don't do the research to look, expand the knowledge, to look outside. And 
think outcomes of the decisions are under our control. That's really big. How many of you think, really think your decisions are totally under your control? And, the, and the, the, the results of your research are under your control? Anyone? They, they are, right? Anything that's outside of your control? Yeah, you, don't, you never have all the information you need. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Never have <coughs> and you will sometimes, in a later deposition, get some of that missing information from earlier. Sure. <coughs> and what's the result of that? Sometimes change in opinion. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So one of the things we look at is you know, if the, we need to get as much information as we can, but again, as Bill said, sometimes it comes in a lot later as we do more research. So how are biases expressed? Some are on the unconscious level, some are on the conscious level. We'll look more in terms of those, but when we say are, are on the conscious level, we base them on the knowledge that we have. We consciously make a decision. I understand this, so therefore I'm going to make it, I, I perceive something, so therefore my bias becomes at a conscious level based on my perceptions. On the unconscious level, this is where many of the biases occur. We don't even realize that the bias exists. We, we read about something occurring in the paper, so therefore we, we, we become fearful that that will occur to us. Example, an airplane crash. If there's an airplane crash, people get afraid to fly. Why? It's no less safe today than it was yesterday. But on the unconscious level, there's this bias because of, of, the, no of our biases. The, because it's there, you expect it to be in the in the solution box, it's be in that box it and it's not there. It causes discomfort. And think about that from your cases. Do you ever look for something you expect it to be there, and it's not there, and you just keep looking for it and looking for it because you anticipate it? I must be missing something. All the time. And that goes exactly to the question you asked earlier about putting your biases aside. See? It's hard to put your biases aside. Okay. So there are two types of bias. We talk about cognitive bias and, motiva and motivational bias. Cognitive bias occurs when people see what, they want, see what they want to see. And motivational bias, well, that's because your attorney, the attorney who hired you said, I want you to solve the problem, here's the solution. Causing a motivation, and we'll see how sometimes that can actually affect what you do, whether you want it to or not. Because the expectation is that that's the solution. It's the expectation that that's the solution. So here's a framework for bias that uh, I, here's the, the source if you want to go look up the article. It's a really interesting article. And what, what this author is saying is that, excuse me, on an emotional factor, the, which would be motivational bias, that we have, we have past personality, the situation, a provocation causing an emotion, and that emotion leading to a motivation and the motivation, uh, there are conflicts with, with motivation to be objective because the motivation drives our direction. On the other side, this is more on the cognitive bias side and on the subconscious level, we have our professional background and non-professional background. We have basically genetics. How are, and how were we brought up was the past leading to non-emotional factors. We don't really have, we don't have an emotional tie to the situation, but we have all of this knowledge that we've gained in the past that fun funnels in and limits our objectivity because our focus is based upon what we know exists. How, how many people have seen people extrapolate from one point? I've seen it happen once, so therefore that's how the world works. And what happens on that, in that situation? That's called anchoring heuristics. <laughs> and we're going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And criminalistics, it happens all the time with, with uh, crime scene analysis. Mm -hmm. and can you elaborate on that? Uh, well, a, the head criminalist, when they first come to the scene and process some information, not all, they come to a conclusion as to who perpetrated 
the particular crime. Mm -hmm. And then everybody gets in line behind that, and regardless of exculpatory evidence being presented for the, the defendant, now defendant, mm -hmm. uh, they ignore all that and go to the conclusion. I'm working on a case right now where that is precisely what is happening. Okay, good example. Very good example. Prejudice is very much like that. You experience, you experience an uncomfortable condition with one person and you generalize the whole population. Right, you have a, a, a bad experience with one person and you generalize that to the entire population. Exactly. And that's where we're going to see how you know, we need to get away from this stuff. And as experts, one of the things, is, as you said, we have to put that aside. We have to learn to recognize it, to put it aside. But sometimes even recognizing it doesn't put it aside. <coughs> so motivation and, and, and ability to affect the information processing of jurors. This is straight out of, research, out of research. It's not my opinion. If motivation or ability are low, jurors rely on heuristics. They rely on their rules of thumb. They rely on their beliefs if they don't feel motivated to listen to what you're saying. Means you have to, we as experts, we have to be able to motivate the jurors to listen to us and to understand our story. Jurors rely on representativeness that's lifelike. And what that means is they go into their fund of knowledge, as the previous slide called it, and maybe they saw it in a movie. Maybe that they saw it on CSI. So that's how life works, because that's their experience. I mean, does that really happen? Yeah, it does. These guys did, did the research on it and found out that that very, very situation happens. And that means that we, as experts, have to put our presentation to the jury in a means that makes sense to them that they can understand as, li as real life, that we have to connect with them. 